Welcome back to Daniel's Final Prophecy, Part 8. We are still in Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, so let's keep reading. Now, we're still in verse 1, and I have so much more to say before we move on. The next thing I want to just brief, so briefly talk about is this reference in Daniel 12, verse 1, to the children of thy people. I mentioned earlier on in this series of presentations how that the, this final prophecy of Daniel is hard to understand because of the prevalence of, of futurism and praetorism in the pulpits of the land. And futurism and praetorism are two Roman Catholic doctrines introduced in the 1500s as part of the Counter Reformation. They were totally rejected at the time, but now there is widespread acceptance of those doctrines, particularly. Uh, the futurist school of thought, that is the belief in the rapture, and futurism and praetorism make it really hard to understand the correct understanding of Bible prophecy. Now, one other thing that makes it enormously hard to understand Bible prophecy correctly and what the Lord is saying and to who he is speaking to is when we always call the Jews that we see over in the Middle East, thy people, the people of the book, the children of Israel. If, if our understanding of the scripture, if we read something like Daniel 12 verse 1, the children of thy people, and we think automatically in our minds, oh, that's referring to the Jews over in the Middle East. If that is our thinking, we've got no hope of comprehending the unfolding plan and purpose of God. And I'm not trying to have a go at anybody. I'm, I don't want to be offensive in what I'm saying. But we, we have to realize the fact that the people that are presented to us today in the Middle East, the, the Jewish nation that is there, uh, the, by far the largest portion of them, over 90% of them, are not lineal descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They are not descended from Judah. By far, they are uh, of the group of Ashkenazi Jews. They are descendants from Ashkenaz. We read about that in uh, Genesis. And there is a large amount of the blood of Esau in them. In other words, a lot of them are what we would call Ijumean Jews, descendant from Esau. And there's nothing new about that. If we go to the time of Christ, Herod, Herod the fox was an Ijumean Jew. We know that Jesus said to the scribes and the Pharisees, ye are not of my sheep. Why did he say that to the scribes and the Pharisees? My sheep will hear my voice. You guys can't hear anything because you're not of thy sheep. So the point I want to make here is that when we are Reading in Daniel 12, verse 1, the children of thy people, we can't just think to ourselves about the Jews in the Middle East, else we won't properly understand what the message is. The fact of the matter is, the bulk of the children of thy people are found in the house of Israel. The house of Israel that went into the Assyrian captivity between 745 and 721 BC, they migrated northwest. They formed the stock of the Anglo-Saxon nations, the nations of Northwest Europe, Ireland, Britain, Canada, Australia, South Africa, United States of America is where we find the bulk of the children of thy people. And that's not to say that there are not some true Judahites uh, in the in Palestine today. I'm not saying that, but what I am saying is that nationally speaking, the bulk of Daniel's brethren are in the West. They are in the Anglo-Saxon nations. And if you haven't viewed it already, please go and view my series on the two houses, also found at my website. That will give you a lot of understanding about the house of Judah and the house of Israel and by knowing that it will help you have it'll help you to focus in on what the word of the Lord is saying rather than what the preachers are dishing out from the pulpits and what they're dishing out is often 
so far from the truth, it's just a terrible shame. So, let's understand who we are, are speaking about, the children of thy people. Were there true Jews that suffered um, when Jesus Christ came onto the scene? Yes, they were. It tells us in the Gospels, many of the Jews believed. It tells us in the book of Acts that many of the Jews received the Holy Spirit. But nationally speaking, the Jews rejected. And Daniel's people went out. They left the city before it was destroyed. And they joined up with their other brethren uh, beyond the great river Euphrates and onwards in the house of Israel. Okay, let's keep going. Daniel 12 verse 1 introduces us to Michael, the great prince, standing for the children of thy people. Who is Michael? There are a number of views as to who Michael is. Uh, for those that follow the futurist school of thought, uh, there's something to the effect that this Michael will be an archangel who, at some point in the future, at the end of the seven years of great tribulation, he's going to deliver the Jews because after all, the Jews are God's special, uh, by fighting against the Antichrist. But the, with, the future school of thought, though, is based upon wild speculation. It is not based upon Scripture interpreting Scripture, and its bedrock is Roman Catholic doctrine that was introduced as part of the Counter-Reformation. Can we do better than this? Yes, we can do better than this by letting the scripture interpret itself. Let's look at it. Daniel 12 verse 1 gives us enough information to work out who Michael is. In Daniel 12 verse 1, he's called the great prince. Who in the Holy Scriptures is the great prince? Daniel 12 verse 1 tells us that Michael intercedes for God's people. Who in the scriptures ever liveth to make intercession for us? Do you know his name? Who in the scriptures is capable of being able to deliver every one found written in the book? And by the way, what book might that be but the book of life that we read about? in the book of Revelation. In Jude, Michael is called the Archangel. And by definition, there can only be one head. There can only be one Archangel who is above and over all the other angels, the chief of the heavenly hosts. Do you know anybody in the Bible that fits that description? And additionally, we are told in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16, that the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel. Who is this? It can't be anyone other than the Lord Jesus Christ himself. He is Michael, the great prince. He is the one that has been standing up over the last 2,000 years and delivering his people. He's the only one who has the power to do it. He's the only one who has the authority to do it. He is above all and he directs all. He is over the whole host of heaven. And in saying all of this, we are, we, we, I am not saying that Jesus Christ is a mere angel, a created being. No way known. He is above the angels. Hebrews chapter 1 clearly tells us. And the angels worship him. This is our Jesus Christ. He is Michael. The great prince. Which stands for his people. The people of the book. The children of Israel. And he is capable of. And he does deliver everyone found written in the book. So when we consider Jesus Christ as Michael the Archangel, we only need to move across to something like Revelation chapter 10, which tells us about another mighty angel coming down from heaven, clothed with a rainbow. 
Uh, his face as it were the sun and his feet as pillars of fire. In his hand was a little book. That's the open Bible. It's talking about the Reformation in Revelation chapter 10 and 11. Uh, he has his foot upon the sea and his left foot upon the earth. And he cries with a loud voice as when a lion roareth. Revelation chapter 10 verses 1 to 2 is also speaking about Jesus Christ in terms of a mighty angel, a mighty messenger. It is the same person that we are that we are reading here in Daniel chapter 12 verse 1 he's standing up for the children of thy people it's it's not as though Jesus Christ is doing nothing he is standing up his name this name Michael means one who is like God who is Jesus Christ but God himself when he came he was God manifested in the flesh in the book of Revelation, we have the glorified Jesus Christ, who can be none other than the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. He is the first and the last. He is he that liveth, was dead, and behold, he is alive forevermore. This Michael is Jesus Christ. Nobody else. Let's keep reading. We are told that Michael is here standing. This is another clear reference to the Lord Jesus Christ. If you remember what we said in our very first uh, opening uh, part in this series of presentations, where we read from Daniel chapter 10, verse 5, we saw that there was a certain man clothed in linen whose loins were good. That certain man was Jesus Christ. The fact that his loins were girded well, well, it showed to us that he was ready for action. You don't sit around with your loins girded. You don't lay in bed with your lo loins girded. The girding of the loins uh, indicates and shows that Jesus Christ is a man of action. He's ready to stand for the children of his people. He's ready to step in and deliver. This is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we see again, which I mentioned before in the last slide in Revelation chapter 10, this mighty angel is standing one foot upon the sea and one foot upon the land. And he's crying with a loud voice as when a lion roareth. Jesus Christ is active. He's active now. He's not just sitting on his throne waiting till everything gets sorted out. Jesus is standing for his people. Praise ye the Lord. And again, we read across in Malachi chapter 4, which tells us about the time of the end, that time of great tribulation in Malachi 4 verse 1. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, brothers and sisters, but unto you that fear my name, the Son of Righteousness shall arise. Michael, the great prince, stands. The Son of Righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings, and ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall, because he standeth for the children of thy people and shall deliver every one of them found written in the book. Praise the Lord. I'm not going to leave Daniel 12 verse 1 just yet. We are told Michael stands up and delivers who? I want to speak a bit more now about delivering thy people every one of them who is being delivered who are thy people let's speak a little bit more about that in john 3 verse 16 we're told that god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life uh, the plan of salvation had its practical implementation in the new testament era in the book of acts where they repented were baptized by full immersion in the name of Jesus and received the Holy Spirit and spoke in tongues because it says they had all things in common. So it's not just enough for, for somebody to say, well, I believe, therefore I am saved, because the outworking of what Jesus was saying in John 3, verse 16, is also in the book of John, uh, be born of water and of the Spirit. And we know what all of this means by reading the book of Acts. But I don't want to go into all of that right now. What I want to point out then is that does God deliver Christians? Yes, God does deliver Christians. And sometimes that does mean that Christians will endure terrible uh, tribulation and some will die. In fact, 
the record of history is that millions have died for the name of Jesus Christ. It's in the book of Revelation, in prophecy, and it's in the pages of history. It's, it's only too well known. known. But, but I want us to understand that when, when Michael is delivering his, his people, every one of them, we can't just restrict that to the church made up of anyone and everyone. God bless anyone and everyone that has come to the Saviour, being born of water and of the Spirit. God bless them of whatever race, background that they come from. But we got to get a grip on still who the sheep of the book are, who are the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Who did Jesus came to? He said he'd come to seek and to save that which was lost. Who was that? Well, the people that he came to seek and to save, the people that were lost, that were put away in punishment, were, of course, the lost sheep of the house of Israel, who had been divorced by God, put away in the Assyrian captivities. Uh, they had lost the name Israel. They had forgotten who they were, but God had not forgotten them. And these are the people that are in the Anglo-Saxon nations today, the people that are the stock of those nations. In Romans chapter 11, verse 26, we need to remind ourselves, and so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Sion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. What does that mean? It means what it says. Uh, we tend to bottle up everything in the, every single promise into the church, into a Gentile bride, as it were, and says that all the promises of God are now in the church. But it's, it's just not true. God is still dealing with Israel nationally and spiritually. Nationally and spiritually. Where it says all Israel shall be saved, I'm not here advocating that just because you are born an Israelite and you are an Anglo-Saxon person, you are somehow automatically saved. No, God calls everyone everywhere to repentance. Ye must be born again. Nevertheless, God has made explicit uh, declarations in the scriptures that Israel will respond to his word, that they will come unto him, that they will be saved, even a remnant within all of Israel will be saved, and he shall deliver and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. So I'm appealing uh, to your understanding here that you, that you are aware of where true Israel is. And when we see where true Israel is, we see, we will be able to see that Michael, the great prince, is standing up and he's delivering his people nationally and he's delivering his people spiritually. And uh, I have another series uh, on my website uh, called Romans chapter 9 where we speak uh, a whole lot more about the continuing unfolding plan of God in the New Testament era concerning the Israelites to whom pertains the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the servants, uh, the service of God and the promises, who are the fathers and of whom is concerning the flesh Christ came. Let us not forget that Christ came to redeem his people. And the word redemption is a Israel specific word. You can only redeem something which you owned, you put away, and then you buy back again. The Lord Jesus Christ could not redeem the Egyptians. He could not redeem the Philistines. He could not redeem the Jebusites and all the other nations round about because he was only in covenant relationship, marriage relationship with Israel. He put them away, he divorced them, and he bought them back. That is what the word redeem means. So when we are looking about Michael standing up and delivering his people, if we zero in our attention onto the Anglo-Saxon nations, we can expect to see some of, in fact, we can expect to see a lot of action. Let's look at it. When we think about Michael, that great prince standing up and delivering his people, we can think about times of great spiritual deliverance for the people of God. We read before in previous uh, uh, 
uh, presentation in Daniel 11, verse 34, that his people would be hoping with a little help. And we, we talked about the time when the the p pagan persecutions under Diocletian came to an end in 313 AD when Constantine came to uh, the, the throne of the Roman Empire of the day and the persecutions against the Christian ceased. Yes, that became a time of treachery and deceit as well, but God's people at that time were helped with a little help. They were delivered at that time. Uh, moving along a lot later in the piece, there was the Reformation in the 1500s, that great turning point in world history where the people of God broke off the shackles of the Roman Catholic Church. And we read about that in particular in Prophecy in Revelation chapter 10 and 11. The, the people of God suddenly had an open Bible in their hands because that was also the time of reformation was also uh, preceded by the invention of the printing press which made uh, the, uh, the the bible uh, could be mass produced at a fraction of its former price and the uh, the ordinary common people had a bible that they could own and read in their own language and it was such a time of spiritual deliverance the, the, the breaking away of thousands and of millions of people away from the Church of Rome. Spiritual deliverance that changed the course of world history. Then there were the outpourings of the Holy Spirit in the Wesleyan revivals. And we note that while Britain embraced an open Bible, the continent of Europe by and large did not and they fell into war and revolution. But Britain was spared the worst of it because they had embraced, for the most part, the Protestant Reformation. They had an open Bible and they had a wonderful time of spiritual deliverance, not falling into the same extent of bloodshed that happened back onto the continent. And there were times of, of great awakenings in Britain and in America, great revivals. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit happened. People were, as they heard the word speak, they were filled with the Holy Spirit, began to speak in other tongues by themselves. And so we can look back through the pages of history, some of it not really that long ago, and we can say, yes, God has been standing up for his people. Jesus Christ has been intervening time and time again to deliver his people, every one of them written in the book. And we pray and we expect to see again another great spiritual deliverance in the Anglo-Saxon nations. It's going to happen. It will happen. Praise ye the Lord. So we can think about spiritual deliverance, but there's also another aspect to this, and that is national deliverance. Yes, Jesus Christ has also been intervening in the affairs of his people, the descendants of the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He's been intervening at a national level. We only need to go back to the time of Philip of Spain, unleashing the Spanish Armada upon the English people, upon the people of Britain. He assembled what he thought to be an invincible armada. On, the Ju on July 19, 1588, he set his armada en route to conquer Britain with the blessing of the Pope of Rome. His thought was that he would bring England back into the fold. The numbers of the armada were huge. The English fleet counted only 80 vessels uh, compared to the 149 of the Spanish Armada. And the ships were also disproportionate in size. 50 of the English vessels, including the squadron of Lord Admiral and the craft of the volunteers, were little bigger than yachts of the present day. Even of the 30 Queen ships which formed its main body, there were only four which equaled in tonnage, tonnage the smallest of the Spanish galleons. But a strange event occurred as Spain sought to invade England. A terrible storm blew up. A terrible storm blew up and scattered and dispersed 
that Spanish fleet. Now, now of course, I understand there, there was a lot of other details involved in the Spanish Armada and the invasion of England. I'm just trying to touch on the high points for the sake of time. Uh, Queen Elizabeth I was on the throne at the time and they prayed for deliverance, brothers and sisters. They prayed and he blew and they were scattered. You see, the English had a, an Amada commemorative medal struck. And we can see here on this coin, which celebrates the deliverance from the Spanish Amada, up there I've circled what is in the Hebrew, Jehovah. Jehovah blew and they were scattered. And the deliverance that England had from the hands of Philip of Spain, the Spanish Amadas, they attributed to God. You don't hear anything about this sort of thing in political circles today, but this is a fact. They prayed to God, God stepped in and he saved his people. This is national deliverance, brothers and sisters. On the reverse side of that Amada medal, it says, I am assailed but not injured. And here it pictures the Church of England on a rock, the winds blowing, the Amada approaching. They were assailed but not injured because the Lord stood up, Jesus Christ stood up, Michael the Great stood up and delivered his people. He is, his loins are girded, brothers and sisters. He's done it before and he will do it again. Praise ye the Lord. Here we have here in another Amada medal, it shows people praying, thanking God for divine deliverance. These things are so strange to us today, aren't they? The, descent, the modern day descendants that form Britain and the English speaking nations of the world today, national prayers that seems to be the last thing on anyone's mind. But back then, it went all the way to the top and the queen prayed, the government prayed, the leaders of the land prayed and the people prayed. And you know what? If you pray to God, he's gonna hear. And the Lord intervened and he destroyed and decimated that Amada and the remnant that got home was in a mess. The crew was in a mess and the Spanish never sought to conquer England again. They never sought to put out another fleet. Had they brought England back into the fold, it would have been just a continuation of, of that fourth world empire over and on top of ruling over God's people. But the Lord steps in and he delivers praise his holy name. If we think about national deliverance at the time of the Napoleonic, Napoleonic Wars, I'll read from this article that I've got here. Remember Napoleon, 15 million Britons must give way to 40 millions Napoleon uttered in frustration. He assembled a massive fleet of transports and an army of 100,000 soldiers at Boulogne. Over 100,000 troops were readied elsewhere. Let us be masters of the channel for six hours and we are masters of the world, he declared. But the date of invasion was delayed by the death of the admiral chosen to lead it, postponing departure just enough so that on the 21st of October, 1805, Nelson gained his astounding naval victory at Trafalgar against staggering odds, utterly shattering Napoleon's plans for invasion. Who, who is behind all of this? Is it just the clever Englishman having better generals and better commanders? No, it's not. The Lord hand is there. The Lord is there and he delivers his people and we're going to see it again one day, maybe one day soon, when God's people 
nationally get down on their knees again and praise to God, not just any God. Because if you say today in God we trust, I mean, what does that mean? What God? Who's God? That when they pray to the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, when they turn their face to Jesus Christ, there will be deliverance. Coming down to the time of the First World War, the German army had a slogan, Gott straf England, which meant, may God punish England. And it was the hope of the Germans that God would be on their side and that they would prevail over England. And the reverse turned out to be the case. And was this because England was a superior force? Was it because they had the advantage? No. The promise given by God to Abraham and his seed and their seed seed, Genesis 12 verse 3, and I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. This is why England prevailed. Let's read some other interesting aspects, or let's look at some other interesting aspects concerning World War I. With the outbreak of World War I, the British sent an expeditionary force to meet the Imperial German Army. And this was uh, at a place called Mons. And the Battle of Mons was uh, the first outbreak of war, the first real outbreak of war between the British and the Imperial German Army. The Imperial German Army was much larger in size. And uh, they were of the opinion they were going to run over the lot and be in Paris not long after that. Well, at that time, the British and the German Imperial Army were going to battle at a place called Mons, which I've circled here. At that time, King George V called for a national day of prayer. Something remarkable happened at this same time on the battlefield. Second Chronicles 7 verse 14 says, If my people which are called by name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. What do you think is going to happen when there's a national day of prayer, when the king is praying? Is heaven going to be closed? Something is going to happen when God's people, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, call out. And so God came to the rescue of the British and Allied forces in the Angel of Mons in August 1914. And here we have an artist's depiction of the Angel of Mons halting the German attack. And I just read here from... W.B. Grant's book, We Have a Guardian. In the early months of World War I, the contemptible little British army, as the German high command termed it, was hurriedly equipped and sent across the channel to support the French and Belgian allies. But these combined forces were far weaker in guns and manpower than the Germans, and so, fighting a dogged rearguard action, they fell back before the terrific impact of mass enemy attacks. Serious defeat and tremendous losses appeared inevitable. But what happened? The people which are called by my name prayed. From the very top, from the king downwards, they prayed. And there was an angelic manifestation on the battlefield which halted the German advance long enough to allow the British expeditionary force to withdraw. Now, of course, the war wasn't over then and there. It led to several years of trench, war of trench warfare, and that was a terrible thing. But had the German advance not been halted, the whole thing would have been totally different. But the Lord intervened, and there he sent angels to halt the German advance. If you have never heard of the Angels of Mons before, or you find it incredible or hard to believe that the Lord God Almighty would do that kind of thing, we need to understand that this is nothing new. 
The Lord has intervened time and time again on the side of Israel to save them from the hosts of the enemy. Here's one example in 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 14. It's at a time when there was war between the king of Syria and Israel. Therefore sent he thither horses and chariots and a great host, and they came by night and compassed the city round about. Verse 15, And when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, an host compassed the city, both with horses and chariots, and his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? And he answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened his eyes, the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. Is it is there no precedent for the angels of Mons? Of course there's precedent. It's that's, this is the way that the Lord dealt with Israel when they called unto him. And if the current descendants of Israel call unto the Lord, will he not come and say, yes, he will. Do you believe the scriptures? Or do we say that this is only for Old Testament days, special times, special movement of the Lord? No, the Lord moved like that once. He's done it in modern times. And he will do it again. Praise his name. We again read of visions of angels at the time of the battle for Jerusalem in 1917. And I'll just read a very uh, a brief account from the book As Birds Flying by Andrew Adams. And he says this, One of the most fascinating aspects of General Allenby's extraordinary campaign in Palestine was the insistence by many men officers and other ranks that they had seen visions and angelic beings at various times. The first official mention of this phenomenon occurred in late December 1916. The Anzac Mounted Division and the Imperial Camel Brigade had fought an action at Wadi El Arish near Mag Magdahaba. After the successful battle, the return of the British troops from Magda Haba was marked with a mysterious ser series of night visions. From the Anzac commander, Chevelle, down through to the officers and troopers, visions of ancient buildings, strange animals for the region of Palestine, lighted villages and angelic beings were witnessed en masse. During debriefing, the stories of hundreds of men were cor corroborated through cross-checking examinations. As there was no logical explanation, officially the incident was recorded as lack of sleep, with a reference being made to the mysterious Angels of Mons in 1914, when thousands had seen angelic beings. Reports of angelic beings appeared during fighting, uh, sorry, reports of angelic beings appearing during fighting occurred right up to the cessation of hostilities in Palestine in 1918. They are too numerous to detail. So the manifestation of the armies of the Lord of Hosts is not just one isolated thing. In World War I, it occurred again and again. We read before about what happened at the beginning of World War I. Well, coming to the end of 1917, the the stalemate that the war was in, World War I was in, was changing. The status quo was changing because while the Germans had been fighting a war on two fronts, the Western Front against France and Great Britain and the Allies, and over on the East they had been fighting against Russia. Well, Russia had the Bolshevik, Bolshevik Revolution and they were taken out of the war and were no longer a problem for the Germans to contend with. Russia had its own internal mess to deal with. What this meant, however, was that all the troops on the Eastern Front could now be moved to the Western Front. So again, we are facing the German nation with huge forces available to them to take on the Allies and crush them. Well, this led to a decisive, another decisive battle in World War I at a place called Bethune, which I've indicated approximately with the arrow here shown on this map. 
the British and Allied forces at the time, realizing they were facing overwhelming odds, called for another national day of prayer from the top downwards. And in fact, the United States, who had not yet joined the war at this point, also prayed at this same time. Something remarkable happened on the battlefield again. Again, I will read from W.B. Grant's book, We Have a Guardian. And he says this, in the spring of 1918, the Germans broke through the Allied line. Heavy casualties were sustained. Reserves were practically exhausted and the Americans were not quite ready. Describing how the German advance was checked, an article in the Journal of the Brigade of Guards, Household Brigade magazine, winter, winter 1942 states, at the focal point of the enemy's advance, Bethune, the Germans concentrated high explosive and machine gun fire preparatory to bayonet attack in mass formation. Suddenly, the enemy shell fire lifted and concentrated on a slight rise beyond the town. The ground here was absolutely bare, yet enemy machine guns and shells raked it from end to end with a hail of lead. So you can imagine here, the Germans are raining fire and brimstone upon the Allies. Then suddenly, they changed the direction of where they're launching their assault out to an area of the battlefield where there seemed to be absolutely nobody. What had happened? Well, what had happened was that to the Germans there had appeared a white cavalry. And here we read of this account. Shortly afterwards, our machine guns opened a heavy fire, raking the advancing cavalry with a hail of lead. But on they came and not a single man or horse fell. Steadily, they advanced clear in the shining sunlight and a few paces in front of them rode their leader, a fine figure of a man whose hair, like spun gold, shone in an aura round his bare head. By his side was a great sword, but his hands lay quietly holding his horse's rein. You see, what the Allies couldn't see, the Germans saw a white cavalry, which they first supposed to be some sort of colonial cavalry. So they rained fire and brimstone, uh, heavy artillery on it. They gunned them down, but none of them fell, and still onward came the white cavalry. What did the Germans do? They dropped their guns and their weapons, and they ran and they fled. What was this but the angel of the Lord? What was this but the intervention of the Lord God Almighty in response to a national day of prayer? Doesn't the scripture say, If the people that are called by my name shall call unto me, will the Lord shut his ears? No, he does not. Irrespective of the fact that the people may be deep in sin, rebellion and idolatry and what ha what have you if they call the lord comes in and this is part of our history brothers and sisters if you haven't heard about it before i recommend you get wb grant's book we have a guardian really exciting stuff that occurred uh, in this uh, the war with prince uh, philip of spain world war one world war two God has preserved our people, praise the Lord. We come to the time of World War II, a time early on in the war where the uh, Allied forces had been roundly whipped by the German troops. It was time for prayer again because there was over 300,000 defenseless troops on the beaches of Dunkirk. The British were facing sure defeat, but at the request of King George VI, a national day of prayer was held on May 26, 1940. His Majesty called the people of Britain and the Empire to commit their cause to God. Together with members of the cabinet, the King attended Westminster Abbey, whilst millions of his subjects in all parts of the Commonwealth and Empire flocked 
to the churches to join in prayer. And what happened soon afterwards, the word miracle was on everybody's lips. More than 330,000 troops were evacuated from Dunkirk and the surrounding beaches in May and June 19, May and June 1940. A miracle was heard on all sides. The impossible had happened. 335,000 men had been carried out of the jaws of death and shamed to their native land. In his speech on June 4th, Mr. Churchill referred to a miracle of deliverance achieved by valour, by perseverance, by perfect discipline, by faultless service, by resource, by skill, by unconquerable fidelity. But even so, this deliverance would not have been possible had it not been aided by two wonders, a violent storm and a channel calm. Does the Lord control the weather? Yes, he does control the weather. Can he make it fog one day and storm the next or, or whatever he wants to do with the weather? Of course he can do that. He can just speak to the raging seas and say, peace be still, and they are still. And so it was, there was a miracle of deliverance for the... Uh, the Allied troops stranded on the beaches of Dunkirk. Praise the Lord for that. Winston Churchill says this, said this, I sometimes have a feeling of interference. I want to stress that. I have a feeling sometimes that some guiding hand has interfered. I have a feeling that we have a guardian because we have a great cause and we shall have that guardian so long as we serve that cause faithfully and what a cause it is. Well, Winston, Sir Winston Churchill didn't name that guardian, but we know who it is. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. It is he, Michael, the, the uh, great prince, which stands for the children of, of thy people that is a willing and able to deliver. Do we see spiritual deliverance in the Lord Jesus Christ? Absolutely. Do we see national deliverance through the interference of the Lord Jesus Christ? Absolutely. Because his loins are girded. Because he stands. Because he has the willingness to, he has the willingness to act and he has the power to act. And these are such wonderful things. Again, if you were to read this book, We Have a Guardian, you'd just be thrilled to bits to see the hand of the, of the Lord in the affairs of his people. Praise the Lord. This is the end of part eight. And we're finished with Daniel chapter 12, verse one. We're going to go on with the rest of the chapter in part nine.